Good morning. Our scripture lesson today is from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. can be found in your pew Bibles on page 1137. Listen to the word of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. This is the word of the Lord. Boy, that rings true to me. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Let's pray. Grant, Lord, that whatever it is you want each of us to hear, tune those receptors, speak clearly to our hearts that we might not be able to avoid the truth in your word and be compelled to live it for Christ's sake. Amen. Eugene Peterson has a captivating way of paraphrasing Scripture. I want you to listen to how he begins this final section of Ephesians in, in the message, uh, beginning at chapter 6, verse 10. This is what, how Peterson puts it. And that about wraps it up. God is strong, and He wants you strong. So take everything the Master has set out for you, well-made weapons of the best materials, and put them to use so that you'll be able to stand up to everything the devil throws your way. This is no afternoon athletic contest that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps. A life or death fight to the finish against the devil and all his angels. Be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get, every weapon God has issued, so that when it's all over but the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. Let me ask you one question. When it's all over but the shouting, what will it take for you to still be on your feet? 490 years ago last month, a theology professor named Martin Luther marched up to the doors of the great cathedral in Wittenberg, Germany, and posted there 95 arguments he had with the church for straying from scriptural truth. Summoned to the council at the Diet of Worms, Luther was told to recant his actions and to apologize for his writings against the policies of the church. Luther replied, 
Since your majesty and your lordships ask for a plain answer, I will give you one without horns or teeth. Unless I am convinced by Scripture or by right reason, for I trust neither in popes or in councils, I am bound by the text of the Bible. My conscience is captive to the Word of God. I neither can nor will recant anything, since it is neither right nor safe to act against conscience. God help me. Amen. Almost 2,000 years ago, two fishermen, uneducated in the schools of public speaking and theology, stood before a council of highly trained religious leaders and teachers who demanded that they stop speaking about the claims of Jesus of Nazareth and preaching faith in His name. Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. About 3,200 years ago, an elderly warrior stood before a newly formed nation that was about to occupy land promised to their ancestors by God hundreds of years before. It was a day for which they had dreamed and fought and prayed and waited, and the moment had finally arrived. But before they were dismissed to enter this new world, Joshua challenged the people. If serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Those are people who stood firm in their faith against the odds. We honor them and others of the faith because they were unashamed to take a stand without any guarantee that others would stand with them. They were men and women of conviction who were committed to eternal principles that have withstood the test of time and cultural changes. These and countless others make up that great cloud of witnesses who have gone before us, who are even now cheering us on. As Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 6, to take the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything, to stand. As we honor and remember those who have lived lives of faith and conviction and honor and duty, we bless their memory and we thank God for their witness. But we have to do more than that. We want to hear and respond to the words of encouragement that they have been whispering down through the ages. What are they whispering to us in this hour? First, they're whispering, stand firm against the evils of the day. Edmund Burke once said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. The greatest danger to our country, to our families, to our faith, and the freedoms we enjoy is not terrorism. It's apathy. The greatest threat to the well-being of everything we love is not external. It's internal. Paul clearly pointed out in our lesson this morning that we are confronted by something vastly more powerful than physical armies and weaponry. We're engaged in spiritual warfare that would undermine everything we hold dear. Listen again to Eugene Peterson's paraphrase in the message. This is no afternoon athletic contest that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps, a life or death fight to the finish against the devil and all his angels. The story is told of a fourth century monk who spent his life in prayer and fasting and raising vegetables for the community, gar for the community kitchen. One day this monk 
named Telemachus sensed the Lord calling him to go to Rome. He had no idea why, but obediently he responded and made his journey to the capital of the empire. Arriving during the holiday season, the city was bustling with excitement, and the crowd soon made their, made their way to the Colosseum where the gladiators' fights were being held. Telemachus followed along, still unaware of his mission. As he watched the crowd cheering as men murdered each other for their amusement, this little monk was troubled deeply, unable to sit and watch any longer. Telemachus leapt the wall and started shouting, in the name of Christ, forbear. Nobody paid any attention to this puny little man running around those muscular gladiators except to, to laugh at him. One gladi gladiator sent him sprawling with a blow from his shield. Still, Telemachus refused to stop, rushing in the way of those trying to fight. In the name of Christ, forbear. He continued to shout. One gladiator, almost struck by another because of the monk's interference, furiously took his sword and drove it down into the body of the monk. Suddenly the fighting stopped. The crowd became silent. Then one by one, the spectators began to leave the Colosseum. The gladiators quietly made their way out the gates. The murderous games were over. There were other forces at work, of course, but that innocent figure lying there in the sand, that little monk who boldly stood against the inhumane spectacle of murder as entertainment, became the force that put a stop to the gladiator games in Rome. Dante wrote, the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who, in a period of moral crisis, maintain their neutrality. I'm quite sure that Telemachus is among that great cloud of witnesses that's speaking to us today. Stand firm against the evils of your day. God's counting on you, just as God was counting on us. Second, stand firm for what's good. It takes a lot of courage to stand up against the evils of this day. I think it takes every bit as much conviction to stand up for what's right and good and true. Again, I like the way Peterson expresses Paul's words. Be prepared, he says. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get. Every weapon God has issued so that when it's all over but the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, those are the weapons. Those are the weapons. They aren't just words. Learn how to apply them. You're going to need them all throughout your life. Make a stand for what's good. Many years ago, Anthony Bloom wrote these words. In a world of competition, in a world of predatory animals, in a world of cruelty and heartlessness, the only hope one can have is in an act of mercy an act of compassion, a completely unexpected act which is rooted neither in duty nor in natural relationships, which will suspend the action of the cruel, violent, heartless world in which we live. Some years ago, we visited Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial just outside the city of Jerusalem. There uh, on the grounds, there is a tree planted in honor of Chiyune Sugihara. In 1939, the Japanese government appointed him Consul General to Lithuania. Sugihara defied protocol, and he started writing countless unauthorized visas 
for thousands of Jewish refugees who were desperately trying to flee the Nazis who were closing in on them. Later he went, he was detained in the concentration camp. When he got back to Japan, they told him his services were no longer needed and spent the rest of his life in relative obscurity. A book entitled Conspiracy of Kindness, a tribute to Sugihara, suggests rather strongly that our acts of goodness and love and mercy and compassion and kindness will be the witness that convinces an unbelieving skeptical world of the reality of God's grace. Like the song goes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. During the great revival of 1858, a young Episcopal pastor named Dudley Ting preached some rather courageous sermons against the slave trade that was frankly tolerated by many churches in this country. Ting was very outspoken, and his sermons offended some people in his congregation who were themselves slave owners. They forced him to resign. But his friends wanted him to continue his preaching, and so they rented a hall in which he preached regularly to large crowds. One evening he was preaching to a group of men at the YMCA. His text was Exodus chapter 10, verse 11. Go now, you who are men, and serve the Lord. It turned out to be his last sermon. That week, Ting got his sleeve cut in a corn shelling machine on his family farm. His arm was mangled, and with the loss of blood and the shock, uh, he died shortly thereafter. On his deathbed, he asked his good friend, a Presbyterian pastor named George Duffield, to preach to the men at the YMCA the next Sunday. Duffield asked Ting, what message shall I send for you? And Ting replied, Tell them to stand up for Jesus. Duffield preached that Sunday. His text was Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. And at the end of the message, Duffield read some verses that he had written in response to his friend's last exhortation. He read, Stand up. Stand up for Jesus, you soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner. It must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory his army shall he lead till every foe is vanquished. And Christ is Lord indeed. Lift high his royal banner of love and righteousness, and truth, and goodness, and mercy, and compassion. Paul put the matter this way in his letter to the Romans. Don't allow yourself to be overpowered with evil. Take the offensive. Overcome evil with good. Can you hear Dudley Ting's words to us this morning? Tell them to stand up for Jesus, for what's good and right and true. He's counting on you. And there's one final word that we can hear from this cloud of witnesses today. What you stand against and what you stand for depends on what you stand upon. In other words, stand firm on the Word of God. That's the testimony of Luther, of Peter and John and Joshua and countless others who have stood firm on the rock of ages. We stand firm on the Word of God by committing ourselves to the purposes of God as revealed in the Bible, by believing the promises of God as revealed to the people of God throughout the ages, and by following Jesus, 
the Word of God made flesh. Jesus said, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the man who builds his house on a rock. Rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. That great cloud of witnesses is telling us today to live our lives, to build godly marriages and homes, to take our stand against evil, to stand strong for all that's good and right and true, and to stand firm on the eternal Word of God. Listen to David in Psalm 27. There was a fellow who had his share of troubles, but he kept his sure footing on the rock-solid faithfulness of God's Word. Take his words to heart. This is what David wrote. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. For in the day of trouble, He will keep me safe in His dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Amen to that. Hmm. And speaking of amen, there's a scene from an old television show in which a Catholic priest offers a prayer among a group of people, many of whom were not very religious and so they were unaccustomed to prayer. But the priest offered a good prayer, and then he concluded it with an amen. And there was a, a moment of awkward silence, which was finally broken when someone asked, is that it? To which another person replied, of course, nothing comes after amen. Oh, really? I beg to differ. In a very real sense, the amen is just the beginning. There comes a point in even the most prayerful life when for the moment at least, you're finished praying. There comes a point when you say amen, you open your eyes, you unclasp your hands, you get up off your knees and you go back to work, back to taking care of the kids. What comes after amen is a life of service, but also a life of spiritual warfare. What comes after amen is becoming well-equipped people who can stand tall for God in a world that would put you down. And not until it's all over but the shouting and we're still on our feet will we be able to stand among that great cloud of witnesses and offer that final amen. And all of God's people said, amen, amen.